And now we are going with our first speaker of the night, and Serena Bitti. And she's a professor uh, of molecular statistics in Leiden University. And she moved to Leiden in 2020 uh, for the University College of London, where she did her PhD, and she also was the head of the astrophysics group from 2016. And her interests uh, span a very wide range of topics, but they are all centered around the role of molecules in space especially in the dense gas of the interstellar medium and star forming regions. And her most recent work concentrates on the interpretation of molecular observations in nearby galaxies and on the division of novel techniques for astrochemistry involving machine learning. So uh, let's uh, receive Serena with an applause. And, how stars form uh, from the point of view of molecules. So this um, very short talk will just give you um, hopefully a nice overview about uh, a molecular journey through space. So the idea is that we will go through uh, the various stages um, in clouds where stars form and we will see uh, what role molecules have um, during the, the different stages of star formation. And then uh, I hope that uh, Will, after me, will go into a bit more of the nitty gritty of the molecules and what the molecules, how the molecules are made. Um, okay, so this is, uh, of course, uh, not an astronomy picture, but it's a, a simulation model. But this is how we believe uh, uh, stars form. So stars are always, uh, when they're very, very young, before they become uh, as old as our sun, they are always embedded in a cocoon of dust, and that's uh, represented here by this nice uh, torus, these nice disks of dust. Um, and already I hope that you can see that there are a lot of dark patches there. These are the patches that we can't really see with our eyes. And uh, as a spoiler here, I can tell you that we can see them. We can see those patches through molecules, and this is what uh, I'm here to tell you. But before we go through this journey, uh, let's first uh, uh, see where we stand in this journey. Where are we? So, of course, we are um, in our solar system, and the solar system is uh, in the Milky Way. And just to give you a bit of a feeling from outside, uh, this is our galaxy, and the sun, and the sun is around here, so our solar system is here in this uh, spiral bit of a galaxy, and if you look at it head on here, uh, you can see that the sun is not near the center, fortunately, which is why uh, we can be able to prosper, uh, because we are not very close to the center of our galaxy. So that's where we are, and what is space where stars are formed made of? Well, the space is made of what we are made of, really, is a lot of atoms, a lot of molecules, and not so much dust. So dust is a very little amount compared of the gas in space. And yet it's very, very important, as I'll show you um, in a minute. But first, let's start with, uh, with the basics here. So I like this, um, this uh, nice uh, periodic table because it's colored. And it's colored with different, different colors, and different colors are telling you where all these atoms are from. And uh, this is important from the point of your star formation because it really makes you appreciate that everything is a cycle. Okay, so for example, apart from hydrogen and helium, which they were there when the Big Bang started, so we call them primordial, uh, the rest comes from really from stars. Okay, so all the other elements were produced by stars during their lifetime, usually towards the end when they're dying. And these stars, sorry, these atoms then, of course, will make molecules and they will make the dust. But we also know the stars are coming from clouds which are made of atoms and molecules. So it's a cycle. And in fact, one of the biggest questions uh, that astronomers are still trying to solve uh, is how did the very first stars form? Because if atoms 
and molecules come from the death of stars and they're needed to form stars, then of course it's a chicken and egg problem. problem. Where did the first stars form? But that's a talk for another day. Okay, so space is made of these tiny atoms and molecules, and then from these atoms and molecules, we know that galaxies form, stars form, planets, and eventually life. And this is really what I want to go through today you know, in, the, in the 10 minutes or so, is just to show you how everything really is connected. From sim simple molecules like the carbon monoxide um, and methane, you can form life. Ultimately, when we look for life in our planets, what we're really looking for is water, simple molecule. Okay, so um, let's see here what, uh, how uh, molecules and stars and planets are connected. So this is how it sounds. It looks a very, uh, very busy slide. So let me spend a couple of minutes going through it because really it, this slide is a nutshell of the multi-million year cycle that is star formation. Okay. So uh, my very basic drawing. Uh, uh, so I hope someone at some point will help me to, to. to come to this new century with new type of slides. So far it's only very basic, so apologies for, for the very basic slides. But really this slide uh, uh, tells you that everything is a cycle. Everything starts here, what we call diffuse gas. And the reason why I am putting all these numbers on top of these pictures is because I want you to get a feeling for the physical conditions, the physical characteristics of where stars form. Here, uh, this gas is quite diffuse, and so stars do not form here, everything is in equilibrium. But all you need is a little push here to get to this stage here, and this is really where I want to start my journey. What this is, is um, if you concentrate on this dark patch here, that's a dark molecular cloud, and that is the birth site of stars. And why is this so interesting, despite the fact that it so, looks so boring? Well, it's interesting for two reasons. First of all, because uh, uh, the density uh, is uh, high for, for astronomy, for astronomers. So it's about 10 to the 4 per centimeter cube. What does that mean? Uh, well, it's rarefied as far as the Earth is concerned. So our atmosphere is about 10 to the 19. Okay, so lots of orders of magnitudes higher than the dark molecular clouds. But it's much denser than this gas here, the diffuse gas. So things are starting to get compressed, start getting dense, and that's what we want, stars to form. But another key point is the temperature. Here we are at temperature about 10 Kelvin. That's about minus 263 uh, centigrade. Okay, so we really, really are in a very cold environment. And so you might think, well, the stars are hot. And that's true indeed. But you need to start very cold, otherwise your stars will not form. And I'll tell you why in a minute. Let's uh, keep going here and see that once uh, things start collapsing here, the densities are getting higher, and then higher again, stars start forming. You can see here this bright dot. These are the stars that are forming, they're trying to come out of the dust cocoon. And when they do form, the event is rather violent, and this uh, uh, is shown here in the next slides, where you can see these jets of material, of hot plasma that shoots out from these very young stars, and impact on these dark patches here. These are the dark patches from the molecular cloud. So we have these very amazing uh, environments of very hot stuff impacting on very cold stuff. And so the chemistry that, that, that you see is uh, it's a really dynamic. And of course, during this process is when actually the protoplanetary disks, the disks of planets are, Form. So really, during this very dynamic process is when our Earth was formed. So, well, let's see this from the point of view of molecules. Okay, I told you the stars form from this very cold and uh, relatively dense gas. 
So that is uh, an environment where simple molecules can form from atoms, but only really simple molecules because it's so cold, it takes forever for two atoms to get together and form molecules. Fortunately, the bits of dust that you have in these clouds come to the rescue, and what you have here, you have a lot of molecules, as we shall see in a minute, that forms on the dust. Once a star starts to form, the so-called protostellar phase, then, as I mentioned earlier, you have a little bit of a more dynamical environment, the temperatures increases, and so you can actually start forming uh, more complex molecules. And we shall see what I mean in a minute uh, when I say simple and complex. It's all relative, of course. For, for real chemists, hardcore chemists, what we call complex are very simple molecules. So it's all very relative. Um, when you are at the protoplanetary proto proto disk space, then you have a mixture of uh, complex and simple molecules. Some of the complex molecules become simple again because, again, you have a lot of destructive rays, either ultraviolet rays or other type of rays that destroy the molecule and make them more simple. But then, of course, you know that once the planet forms, then a bigger and bigger agglomeration of dust grains occur, and you start having um, uh, molecules that eventually really form life. And uh, although uh, we don't yet know what happens in this stage, we do speculate a lot. And for us, one of the holy grail is actually to find molecules such as amino acids in space during, uh, during this phase here. Okay, so I told you that these clouds are dark. Um, they're dark, they're invisible in the optical and in the near infrared, but we can see them, as I've already hinted at, because we can see molecules. And the reason why we can see molecules is because they are bright in the microwave region. So these three pictures here are showing you a very near infrared, dark patch, then far infrared you can start seeing a bit, and then here at this wavelength, the microwave wavelength, you see a lot of stuff. And uh, this is because when the material is, when the gas is very cold, as I said, around minus 260 uh, centigrade, then you actually can only see the gas through the emission of molecules. And this is really why molecules are important. So this is your dark cloud again. This is the molecules that form in the gas. And as I mentioned, there are a lot of molecules that form in the gas, in the, on the dust. And this is very important because uh, what happened here is that it's so cold that atoms and simple molecules freeze on the dust, literally freeze on the dust. And uh, when they freeze on the dust, they can hop or tunnel through the dust uh, grain and form bigger molecules. So simple molecules in the gas, more complex molecules on the dust. These are the key things to remember. And this is how it happens in this very simplistic, simplistic drawing. An atom hits the grain, pops, finds another atom, and gets together. Or a molecule hits the grain, pops, finds another atom, and they form a more complex molecule. You already seen this in the news. Uh, this is an amazing picture from the JWST. We already seen this picture like this from the Hubble Space Telescope. But this is a uh, another level of details. So very beautiful uh, pillars of creation. This is where the stars form, and they form because of two very important things that happen. One, the pressure starts increasing because the temperature increases, the pressure increases, and gravity starts taking over because you increase the mass, and gravity starts taking over. So it's, it's a battle between pressure outwards and gravity inwards. Who wins determines the fate of the cloud. If pressure manages always to balance gravity, you've got equilibrium, nothing happens. If gravity at some point takes over, a star can form. And this is exactly what happened. Eventually, gravity will collapse your cloud. 
And when, uh, um, when the clouds collapse, I'm not sure what happened here, it was a nice drawing of a brain, it doesn't matter, but when clouds collapse and form stars, the heat from the star will, imagine here drawing of a brain, dust brain, will um, heat up all those molecules that had formed on the dust in the previous stage. And those molecules come back into the gas phase, but they're much more complex than they were before because they were processed on top of the dust. So, to recap so far what I said, basically what we do when we study molecules, so we do something that we call astrochemistry. And that is, uh, in this particular concept, in this particular context, the study of the multi-million year cycles of the gas that form stars. Um, why do we study molecules? Well, I've already said that this is the only way that we can see these dark patches and we can study the star when it's still embedded in the cocoon of dust. And I just want to point out here this nice picture that I showed earlier, a big figure of jets and pop plasma hitting on the interstellar medium. The star, you can't see the star. The star is somewhere in the middle, completely hidden. So if you were there and you wanted to study the star, all you can do is study this jet and the impacts of the jet on the cloud. Okay? So what molecules do, they actually really help us to understand how stars form at every single stage of this multi-million year cycle. They, different species, different type of molecules will trace different bits of the gas. So you can't just use one molecule to understand it all. So that's why we study a lot of different molecules when we want to study star formation. And um, how do we do that? How do we study molecules? Well, we use a lot of telescopes, and I'm sorry that here the, the, the names of the telescopes, I don't know what happened, the usual translation from PowerPoint to something else. But basically these are all the telescopes that uh, we use. Some are on the ground, very beautiful telescopes such as ALMA, um, that you may have heard of before, I'm sure, and also some are from space, JWST here and Herschel before that. And uh, these telescopes allow us to study um, molecules in the microwave and to study many different molecules in a, a lot of details. Oh, I don't know what this is. Okay. All right, you have more, sorry. Um, all right, so all these telescopes observe molecules, and uh, the type of molecules that we observe will depend on the different regions that we want to observe. So if we want to observe the very early stages, when everything's still diffuse, then we'll go for simple molecules, and as we move on into the journey, we'll observe more and more complex molecules, and ultimately, we are really searching for the largest ever possible molecule observed. And um, the way we do it, we take spectra such as this. So this is not noise. This is a, a real spectrum uh, from, uh, uh, your, from uh, the Orion Nebula. All these lines, they're all real lines. They're all real molecules. Some of them are identified up here. As you can see, you have methanol, uh, you have formaldehyde, you have many different types of molecules. And uh, all these wiggly lines down here, there are many, many people working really hard to identify every single wiggly line with the hope eventually to find indeed amino acids. And so this uh, brings me to my last slide, so I think I'm time more or less. Um, and really, uh, a lot of us are not just interested in molecules for the sake, uh, sorry, for, for as a tools to study star formation. A lot of us are also interested in finding as, as large molecules as we can in space. So these are all molecules that have been observed in both uh, in systems, in sterile nurseries, where both small stars, such as our sun, are born, as well as big stars. And uh, in fact, of uh, particular interest are these molecules which, are, uh, which have a peptide bond, 
which means they've got uh, uh, nitrogen, um, carbon and oxygen uh, in a close bond here because uh, apparently they are very important for the formation of RNA. So all these molecules here, these large molecules that I cannot even pronounce some of them, they have been detected um, in space. And I'll leave you with one last interesting fact that in fact these molecules are not very abundant in stellar systems like our sun, like our solar system, but they're very abundant where massive stars are forming, big stars, stars that eventually will go, will die as supernova. <coughs> this is an interesting fact because uh, um, it, it gives um, some proof of one of the recent theory that says that the, when our sun was born, our solar system, in fact it was born as part of a, uh, a bigger system where much bigger stars were forming as well. And so maybe this could be controversial, maybe we need big stars that you know that end up in supernova nearby to actually add life after all. And this I'll finish. Thank you very much. I think I'm not wrong if I say that the country produces exactly what is in space, right? So 
uh, and vacuum, uh, you know, they do reproduce vacuum conditions, but I think there are a few, few magnitudes off compared to uh, what you have in this case. But the temperatures, there are some experiments that they do manage to reach the 10 Kelvin of minus 260 uh, centigrade. So some experiments to do that. So you can do it. It's, I think it's very, well, at least I think it's very hard. We'll, uh, we can say more, of course, but, but they do. And then, you know, they, they are close enough that we feel that we can extrapolate towards something in space. And then, of course, let's not forget the thanks to, to telescope, such as, for example, the JWC, which I'm sure we will talk about, which they show the, the material on these grains. Uh, this this uh, information from the telescope confirming to us what the labs are telling us. So we feel confident that what they reach in the lab is, is good enough. Now I have a question. Uh, so if you're looking for precursors of amino acids, mm -hmm. uh, you need RNA to have them combined to proteins uh, eventually. But that happens in a, in a planetary, relatively stable situation. Yeah. So is this not, and you're talking about gas clouds, yeah. etc. So is there not some en enormous disconnect? Yes, that, yeah, there is a very large gap. So what we would like to achieve is to find uh, very, very basic amino acids, such as glycine, which there is a hint that is there. Uh, and then our hope, but we don't know, this is, there is indeed a big, a big jump, right? So our hope, however, is that these basic ingredients can survive the trip to Earth, in a sense, right? It's not so easy because, of course, you've got uh, uh, UV radiation from, from these young stars that would, you know, during the trip, completely destroy these molecules. Uh, however, if we do see them, if we do see things such as glycine in such harsh environment, then there is hope that enough survives to kickstart, not necessarily the, the only way that you could kickstart life, but that's why one is looking for, you know, um, bacteria and viruses in, in other well, more planets, but at least within our solar system, right? So, I think, I think the, the, the message here is that we were not expecting 20 years ago to see such large molecules in space because we thought they would all be destroyed by the harsh conditions, the irrigation, etc. And yet we see them. So when we are observing the spectral pattern, spectral line data from nebulae and gas clouds, uh, we, what we are looking at is multiple elements, multiple molecules, they, all the light comes together. Now, how do we um, translate that? Uh, because we know there is a Doppler effect happening over there, mm -hmm. and all the lines are shifted. Yes. Now, how do we know that exact delta by which we have to translate that to actually recognize what we are actually looking at? And yeah. because the, all the data is mixed up. Yeah, so, okay, so we of course, we know the rest, what we call the rest frequency of the lines, right? So from the lab we know that a particular line of carbon monoxide occur in this particular frequency. Then we know that the object we're looking at, we know the Doppler shift, so we can, you know, move our, our instruments so that we end up looking at the particular frequency where we know that particular line should emit. And different lines have different frequency. So uh, I showed it, I think, in one of my um, yeah, here, right. So uh, different different lines are of, of different uh, elements will have different frequencies. Now, some are very close together, so they can blend. Okay, and this is a huge problem that we have. You know, we are again people spending hours and hours trying to de-blend lines. But thanks to again laboratory experiments that tell us exactly where each line should be, and then thanks to the fact that we know. The, the, the distance uh, of the object, so you know where to shift, then we can identify the lines. But there are, it's not so strong, I mean, I gave you a simple answer, there are a lot of uh, checks that we go through to make sure that we're not mis, uh, misinterpreting or mis, uh, you know, identifying a line. Thank you. I think one last question. Um, yeah. okay. um, Nice that you show this spectrum. Uh, I guess this is done in divisible lights. And you showed a few of the telescopes that you are using. Uh, this is in, done by from space. From space, yes. Yeah. But um, what are all the different 
uh, radio waves that you can use, yeah. radio waves, uh, visual light, yeah. 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 molecule, uh, yeah. infrared, things like that. Yeah, exactly. So, indeed, so you can use, uh, so in the optical, there are there many molecules. So, we don't really use an optical telescope much, we have some, but not, not, uh, not for our purposes, because basically um, it all depends on. Uh, the structure of your molecule and it depends on the temperature and the density of the gas. And then that molecule will emit up different frequencies in different wavelengths. So what we use, we use uh, generally far infrared as a molecule, so a millimeter, so a microwave and radio frequencies. These are the frequencies that we use, where uh, most of the lines emit. So if you now went uh, uh, from here, this is a far infrared, yes, there is no, nothing underneath here, but uh, if you, this is far infrared, if you went in the near infrared, you will see less lines, and if you went in the optical, you probably will see no lines for molecules. Okay, so uh, let's thank Serena again. If you have any questions.